For many of us out there who cheer for a particular sports team, we want to cheer, of course, for our team to win every game they play in. But we also have rooting interest in games that may directly impact the team that they're not playing in. So, for example, if you're a Patriots fan, you may always cheer against the New York Jets no matter what happens. If you're a Red Sox fan, you may always want to cheer against the Yankees no matter what's going on around the country and who the Red Sox are playing. Likewise, when it comes to the Second Amendment, I think there are rooting interests as well. And sometimes we're going to talk about other cases that you should be rooting for and why you should be rooting for them, even though they don't directly impact the Second Amendment, but they might indirectly do so. We'll talk about that in one second. One such case is the so-called racial preference or affirmative action cases out of the University of North Carolina and Harvard that are being argued right now before the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's talk about those and what you need to know about them from a Second Amendment perspective in just one second. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and best-selling author. If you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so and show that you love the right to keep and bear arms. Okay folks, we have a big case being argued this week in the United States Supreme Court is actually two cases that have been consolidated. One case involves the University of North Carolina. The other case involves Harvard University. And what are these cases about? They're basically about whether or not the admissions committees at those schools are allowed to consider people's race as to who they let into their student class. Meaning, can they deny you an entry because you're white and let somebody else in because they're black, for example? That's the question. Well, the answer would seem quite obvious under basic black letter law in America that you cannot consider people's race as a general matter. You can't discriminate against people because they're black or white. Uh, you know, when you rent to them, when you hire them, whatever it is in America, you can't tell black people or white people they can't sit at your lunch counter. That's all gone. And why is that gone? Well, for two major reasons in the United States. After the Civil War, the United States enacted the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment said various things, but specifically the 14th Amendment, which was designed to bring the African-American slaves who had just been freed thanks to the Civil War into the American polity to become full-blown citizens. And one of the critical parts of the 14th Amendment was the Equal Protection Clause. And what did the Equal Protection Clause say? Here it is from our United States Constitution. This is not my opinion. This is not your opinion. This is actually from the United States Constitution itself, the 14th Amendment. It provides specifically that no state can deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. Again, the key language from the Constitution, and obviously that's been interpreted to say you can't discriminate on the basis of race if you're a state actor. And what exactly is a state actor? Well, state actor is simply a government actor. It's the federal government. It's a state government. It's a town. It's a village. Those are state slash government actors. They are governed by the 14th Amendment that says you cannot deprive people of um, equal protection of laws. So the argument with respect to the University of North Carolina, which is a state institution, it's a government institution owned and run by the state of North Carolina, uh, to the extent a university like UNC, which is public, uh, state-run, government-run, they cannot discriminate on the basis of race in any respect. And apparently, according to the allegations brought by these lawsuits, the argument is that North Carolina, University of North Carolina has been prioritizing certain races above Asians, I believe the argument is, in terms of who they let in. And therefore, this consideration of race has disproportionately hurt certain racial groups and disproportionately benefited others for no other reason because of their race. And that's unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. But bear in mind that we also have a second related case involving affirmative action involving Harvard University. Now, Harvard University is a slightly different situation because they are not run by the government. They are a private institution. However, they're a private institution that takes federal money. It takes federal subsidies. And because it takes federal subsidies, meaning federal money, as a private institution, Harvard University has an obligation to comply with the Civil Rights Acts of 1964, specifically a particular title of the 64 Act, uh, that's Title VI. So Harvard has to comply with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And what exactly does Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 say? Well, let me tell you if this sounds relevant to discrimination on the basis of race. It says, this is the relevant statute, no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin 
be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Again, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act specifically provides that no person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And because Harvard is a private institution in Massachusetts receiving federal money, Title VI applies to them. So how do we live in a world right now where up until now, for the last several decades, both private universities like Harvard and public universities like the University of North Carolina and others have basically been able to consider people's race as to who they admit into their student body, who they admit into their schools. And the answer is a series of Supreme Court cases that were a little bit nutty. I just want you to understand the context because the smarter you are when it comes to the history of the Supreme Court, the history of the Constitution, the way to think like a lawyer, the better you'll be for all issues touching on these things, which of course particularly is important for anyone discussing the Second Amendment, uh, which is fundamentally in the Constitution, right? So we really want to be able to understand other issues and understand the logic and the history there, because all that information will allow you to be a better advocate for the United States Constitution as it's currently written, as well as, of course, for the Second Amendment, which is part of the U.S. Constitution. So let's explain what happened. So after the 1964 Act, it says, as you read, you cannot uh, consider race. And the 14th Amendment says you cannot consider race. So what happened? So basically what happened is out in California, you had the University of California Medical School, I believe it was, was had a racial quota. And I think it was something like 16% of its a class, incoming class, had to be for minorities, racial minorities. So the University of California had 16% were set aside quotas, if you will, for racial minorities. So a gentleman by the name of Baki, B-A-K-K-E, sued uh, Mr. Baki, tried to get into medical school twice. He was turned down. He then sued, claiming that he was discriminated against because his qualifications on the merits were better than a lot of the people in that 16% set aside for minority applicants. So Mr. Baki said this was a violation of the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act and all sorts of other things and said this was illegal. Now, what the Supreme Court did in a fractured decision called California versus Baki in 1978, and this is critically important to understand, okay, because this is how the this is how the liberals do sleight of hand. They take an exception from some ruling and they blow it up to change the world and to swallow the rule, which is what I think they're trying to do with sensitive places in the Second Amendment. They're trying to take the so-called sensitive place exception and blow it up to swallow the right to carry guns in America. I don't think it's going to work, but again, this is just another example. So you're going to see how, the, if you understand how the liberals think, you will be able to spot their activity when they start something and be able to nip it in the bud before they get down the path and establish all these precedents in their favor, which is critically important. You want to, uh, you know, as they say, uh, you want to nip it in the bud, uh, you know, kill it in the crib, whatever metaphor you want to use, you want to you stop it at the beginning before it gets up and rolling. And here's an example where that failed back in the 70s when it comes to affirmative action and racial preferences. So here's how it happened and how the left exploited this passing reference in the Supreme Court decision of Baki in 1978. So, in 1978, in the Baki decision, there were nine justices on the Supreme Court, just like there were now. Four of the justices said that considering race under the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act, in this context, meaning in college admissions, was illegal, unconstitutional, could not be done. Four said that. Four said it was perfectly fine to have these set-asides, it was perfectly okay, no big deal, it's okay, we can consider race, it's fine. So it was tied four to four, four to four. Nine justices. What would happen to the ninth justice? Critically important. So a single judge, Justice Powell, one just one justice wrote a concurrence. He wrote an opinion that he said that the racial quotas were unconstitutional and illegal. So you could not have at a university like 10% of these seats are going to go to blacks or 15% of these seats are going to go to whites or whatever it is. You cannot have racial quotas. That was not allowed. And Justice Powell, the fifth vote, said yes. What happened with the University of California and Mr. Baki was unconstitutional and was not allowed. No, no, no. Stop. Okay, so that sounds like a win for Mr. Baki. By the way, he was admitted to medical school and went on and, and good stuff happened to him, I believe. So that's great. But what happened to the precedent? So here's the key, critical fact. So you had four decisions that said the racial quotas were illegal, four decisions from the Supreme Court that said it was no good. And then the fifth justice or the ninth justice, Justice Powell said, although quotas are illegal, although quotas are illegal and no go, and thus California did something illegal, what is allowed, what is allowed is that colleges are allowed to consider race as a single factor. 
is a single factor, one criterion in admissions, because diversity is generally a good idea in a society, especially in college. Ding, 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 ding. There you go. One justice out of the nine used the magic talisman, the magic word of diversity. And guess what happened after that, 1978? Next thing you know, every college in America says, we are not going to do, I don't want to say every college in America, but the left-wing leaning colleges in America, that's as best I can tell. Well, we're not going to do any more racial set-asides. We're not going to have quotas. That's reverse discrimination and illegal. What we're going to do, though, to make sure that our universities and colleges are super smart and have the best education experience, we're going to consider race as one factor in the name of diversity based on what? A single opinion written by one justice, not nine, not six, not even five. One justice, Justice Powell, in the Bakke decision. And next thing you know, from 1978 forward, the word diversity is the special snowflake word that the liberal academics all across America use to consider race, which you would never be allowed to do. So if I consider somebody's race in hiring, or if I consider somebody's race in firing, you get sued, right? If you know this is totally illegal, except because of the Baki one justice, right? One justice. That's the key point. One justice, Justice Powell's reference to diversity. Every university, or at least every liberal university, started to do this. And next thing you know, diversity is the talisman that allows them to discriminate on the basis of race, as I see it. So then what happens, we have a few decades past, universities are continuing to discriminate on the basis of race using the D word, the diversity word, and then we get to a decision called Grutter versus Bollinger. Grutter versus Bollinger is out of the University of Michigan, and in this case, it was the law school, and Barbara Grutter sued claiming that this diversity consideration was still reverse discrimination. They were not allowed to be considering race under the 14th Amendment, which says you can't consider race under the Due Protection Clause, under the Title uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And because they were considering race, again, it was no can do. Affirmative action needs to go away. Racial preferences need to go away. But in a five to four decision where Justice O'Connor, the first a female justice on the Supreme Court, the first nominee to the Supreme Court by Ronald Reagan, she uh, sides with the liberals and says that, yes, you can discriminate on the basis of race for the purposes of the compelling state interest of great schooling and great colleges and great universities. Uh, and therefore, she said that for another 25 years, is really an absurd ruling of judicial activism. We don't need to break it down in this case. Uh, but the bottom line is, Justice O'Connor said and sided with the liberals in a five to four decision in Grutter versus Bollinger that guess what? That race could be considered. Why? Because it advances the compelling state interest of diversity. See how that works? A single justice in Bakke in 1978, a single opinion in Bakke in 1978, one opinion by one justice that breaks that four to four tie, right? Guess what? Becomes the law of the land because the liberals take that, that word diversity and exploit it. And now you have a five to four decision but with, with you know, Justice O'Connor in the majority, a Republican appointee by Ronald Reagan, you know, upholding race discrimination despite the clear language of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause and the clear language I read to you of the Civil Rights Act of, 19, of 1964, which you're not allowed to discriminate if you take federal money. And that's what was going on, apparently. I'm guessing that's what was happening. That was the allegation at the University of Michigan back then. Okay, so why should you care about this case if you're a Second Amendment advocate? The answer is because we have a text-based right, a right to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment. We always want to be cheering for this Supreme Court to follow the law as it's written, uh, right? We want to do that. And obviously, um, the text of the, 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 the Equal Protection Clause and the text of the Civil Rights Act clearly say you can't consider race uh, in the context of these decisions, including college admissions, either by private universities that take money from the federal government or by state actors like the University of North Carolina is a state actor, government run, state run, state owned, all that stuff. Um, this is a no-go zone. So it looks like the Supreme Court took this case probably to get rid of affirmative action, racial preferences once and for all. Okay, so I uh, hope you learned a little bit something here today. I know it's not specific to the Second Amendment, but again, this is something you want to cheer for. You want to cheer for this court to uphold the 14th Amendment as it's written. You want this court to apply and interpret the uh, Civil Rights Act as it's written because we always want these justices following the law as written because that's good for the Second Amendment because we have a very compelling, well-written, well-crafted Second Amendment in the text of the Constitution. So we don't want any judicial activism trying to get around that because that's bad for all of us as Americans, especially those that support the Second Amendment and the, tech and the Constitution itself. Okay, hope you learned a little bit something. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner.
orders up. Table 2A.